This story I'm about to tell you takes place roughly 40 years ago, where one of the most horrific commercial diving accidents in history would unfold. November 5th, 1983, 4 a.m. In the Norwegian sector of the North Sea, the Biford Dolphin drilling rig continued to operate at its normal pace. Deep beneath the water's surface, two saturation divers would be continuing their shift as usual at the bottom of the ocean floor. Saturation divers are specialized commercial divers, whose tasks primarily range from underwater inspection to construction, repairs, and maintenance. These divers in particular had been working for more than 12 hours at this point, and they were coming to the end of their shift. So they finished up what they were doing and climbed back into their dive bell. Diving bells are strong chambers made to transport divers back and forth between the deep sea job site and the water's surface. It's essentially the same as you driving to work in your car, except their uniforms are diving suits, their mode of transport is the diving bell, and where they would arrive to clock in, depending on the time and depth, would be so deep underwater, so dark that if you didn't have a light, you wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your own face. There are a few kinds of dive bells. The kind that they had was basically a big pressurized metal container with a cable that could pull them back up when they needed. Before we continue, I need to go over some crucial information to paint a better picture of the story, but we'll get back to those divers shortly. Now, because of the extremely hazardous depths they work in, they are required to breathe in a special gas mixture to prevent oxygen toxicity and the narcotic effects of nitrogen narcosis that follow. Breathing in normal oxygen past certain pressures is toxic to breathe. Inhaling this special gas mixture helps dilute the oxygen to a non-toxic and safe level. But in doing so, the dissolved gas begins to accumulate in the tissues. This is why divers have decompression stops before they return to the surface, so that through time they can safely eliminate these gases out of their system. These stops would differ in length depending on how deep and how long they've been submerged. If you were to surface too quickly without taking the appropriate stops, the gas wouldn't have time to clear from your blood properly. This gas has to go somewhere, and with it now being under less pressure, it would begin to expand, creating bubbles in your tissues and blood, settling in major joints like the knees and elbows. Decompression sickness also known as the bends, are the two most well-known terms for this excruciatingly painful experience. In extreme cases, it can even take your life. For these reasons and many others, divers have to be very careful and calculated about every single detail when it comes to any dive. However, once the dissolved gases reach full saturation in a diver's tissues, and no more inert gas can be accumulated, the decompression time doesn't actually increase. The diver is now fully saturated. This is where we get the term saturation diving from. Saturation diving takes advantage of this by keeping divers in this saturated state, usually for up to weeks at a time. In most places, the standard being 28 days. This is so they can greatly reduce the time it would take to decompress. And once they're finally done, they would only have to be decompressed to the right pressure one time. For example, if a diver's tissues were completely saturated at a depth of 650 feet, it would take them about 8 full days of decompression to safely surface. Once you're fully saturated to a depth, whether the dive lasts 1 day or 12, the decompression time will ultimately be the same. So for safety and efficiency, this is why they're kept at this pressure for weeks at a time. Now that we've covered that vital information, let's get back to those divers. When they were finished their shift, they climbed back into the diving bell and the hatch was closed so as to maintain the same pressure as they ascended. This pressure allowing them to avoid decompression stops for the time being. They were winched back up to the Biford Dolphin drilling rig where they would be able to connect their chamber to the living quarters. The living quarters were pressurized to 9 atmospheres as well, so that it would match the same pressure as the diving bell. The pressurized living area was comprised of three sections. 
When they arrived, the dive bell was attached to a trunk connecting to chamber one. In chamber two, there were two other divers resting on their beds, and chamber three was currently unused. The connection to the trunk was kept sealed by a clamp operated by two other experienced divers referred to as dive tenders. The divers that had just arrived left their wet equipment in the connection trunk, climbing their way into chamber one. The two divers controlling the clamp began their procedure. Every time they would lock down the connection, they would follow five steps. Number one would be closing the bell door the door that was open to the trunk that led into chamber one. Number two would be to just slightly increase the pressure in the dive bell so that it would seal the bell door tightly. Number three, close the door to chamber one, which led to the trunk and the dive bell. Step four would be to depressurize the trunk back to one atmosphere, essentially just back to normal pressure. And for the last step, open the clamp separating the dive bell from the other chambers. If only that's what had happened. Unfortunately, not every step was made successfully. Step one, close the diving bell door. Step two, slightly increase the pressure in the diving bell. Step three, Close the chamber one door. Except, sadly, step five had begun before step three was completed. Step five was to disconnect the clamp. The first two steps were successful. At the time, it was believed one of the dive tenders controlling the clamp that was keeping the trunk sealed mistakenly opened it before the diver inside had a chance to close the chamber door. The result? Both chambers were subjected to explosive decompression. It went from nine atmospheres of pressure to one, faster than you could blink. Air rushed out of the chamber with such horrific force that it jammed the interior trunk door shut, the force violently pushing the dive bell away and striking the two dive tenders. Every diver on the inside wouldn't make it. They were gone instantly. Only one out of all six would survive, and the only survivor was severely injured. In the post-mortem examinations for three of the divers, it was stated that, with the rapid pressure difference, their blood boiled instantly, completely stopping their circulation on the spot. It read that there were large amounts of free fat in the cardiac chambers in the great vessels, as well as some other smaller vessels. Because of the instantaneous boiling of the blood, it led to what they referred to as fat precipitation. The rapidly expanding gases in their tissues had to go somewhere. And it did. Diver number four was standing closest to the door when it happened, presumably in the process of attempting to complete step three, closing the chamber one door. He was absolutely mutilated as his body was forced out through a 24-inch space left by the partially jammed door. The post-mortem examination would also state, due to the expulsion of most of his organs, it suggested that part of him must have exploded. His body? Completely unrecognizable, pulverized, and torn to shreds. Pieces and scraps of him, everywhere. The trunk door was made with a center hinge. The door essentially rotated around its center on a vertical axis. In this case, the door had been rotated too far to one side, which left a crescent-shaped opening instead of sealing properly. The clamp could have been opened prematurely due to miscommunication. Maybe it was an order from their supervisor. Maybe due to some kind of confusion, they opened it through their own accord. They were working very long shifts, it could have just been fatigue. The rig and the sea were loud and all they had to communicate was a bullhorn attached to the wall. Maybe 
they just misheard. Or maybe it was just gross negligence from the employer. The Biford Dolphin diving system was outdated. It didn't have fail-safe hatches, exterior pressure gauges, or any mechanical preventative measure to stop the steps from being completed in the wrong order, or while the system was still under pressure. Related entities and former members of Biford Dolphin would claim the investigation was a cover-up. They would say that the ones in charge of the investigation didn't report on the disgusting exemptions made when it came to vital equipment needed for the crew. Vital equipment that could have prevented this disaster entirely. A lawsuit was later made by related parties of the profession and the families involved in the incident. They would push for further investigation, obtaining a crucial report by February 2008. For some time it had been suggested that it was one of the dive tender's fault that this all happened. Many disagreed with this, but this report indicated with proof that the real cause was faulty, outdated equipment. The families involved would eventually receive compensation for the damages. 26 years after that horrible day. These are the five people that left us that day. The name of the only one that survived is 32-year-old Martin Saunders. Here are some quotes found from Martin Saunders after the incident. I was a bit further away when I decided to walk towards Cramond. When the blast occurred, I was approximately one meter away from the bell. Everything went black for a few seconds. Then I felt a combination of comfortable warmth and insane pain. My face was so messed up they didn't recognize me when they found me. They found me with my upper body partly under the four-ton diving bell. For a moment they thought I was dead, so I tried to move my fingers so that they would see that I was still alive. When he got into the helicopter, he had noticed that his lungs had collapsed. I knew I had to keep breathing, or else I'm done. Kramen was lying next to me and passed in the helicopter on the way to the hospital. What has bothered me the most ever since it happened was, why was I the only survivor? I feel guilty. I feel like I've won the lottery. By cheating.